All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Is this working? I have reinstalled my operating system yet again, and since I'm on Linux, I never know if the sound is going to work, or anything for that matter. Um, I also have a fan on in the background because it's like 100 degrees in my in my office right now. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, hopefully that doesn't create any audio problems. Uh, let me know in the chat if you're experiencing any difficulties. Um, just check on the stream here. Oh good, looks like we're up. So yeah, use the chat. Um, thank you, Mariah, for the update about the sound. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, so it's been a while. I want to catch you up on some of the project, what's going on lately, and what I'm going to work on today, and we'll do some coding. Um, so we have some open pull requests and issues. We actually have the highest number of open pull requests and issues that we've had as a project in a long time. Um, I've also noticed that uh, there's, it's been a lot busier too. So um, I've noticed a lot more activity in issues, pull requests, and uh, even, what was it, I was just talking to someone I saw at the farmer's market the other day, and they were like, I've seen a lot of talk about Caddy lately, like on the interwebs. Are you doing like a marketing campaign? And um, we're not. Uh, so I think people are just starting to use it more, which is really cool. Um, I do know of several companies, large companies that you've heard of that are integrating Caddy internally. Um, so that's good news. Um, so the project seems to be growing in terms of its user base, uh, so it's not surprising there are more issues and pull requests opened. I am trying to keep it under 100 issues and 20 pull requests <laughs> just to keep things manageable, um, but it's been a little hard to do that lately. Also, we're getting to the point in the project where um, the issues are, like the new features or bugs are often like uh, more complicated or nuanced because a lot of the low hanging fruit and obvious things have been kind of resolved and so things take a little more time, a little more careful thought. Um, but not, not in every case. Um, thanks to Caddy's modular architecture we're able to move pretty quickly and make decisions pretty easily. Um, and so, I mean, what's what's coming up here pretty soon is um, we're probably going to change the way that uh, listeners work on lit on Unix. We're going to use reuse port for graceful reloads. Um, we have a fix here to close hijack connections like WebSockets when you reload or quit. Um, so yeah, uh, we can maybe talk about that. Uh, we have a lot of requests for like gRPC web support. I don't know if it's the same thing as gRPC JSON. Um, but if it is, we're trying to get this bridge going because we have several users who want that. Also, I'm going to try moving this. Oh, there we go. Over here so I don't lose it and I'll try and watch the chat. So if you have something, um, feel free to contribute. This, by the way, in my background here, this is a video that just got posted today, yesterday. Um, the Austin Gill posted this, and this is actually, I just watched this a minute ago, and this is actually a really great walkthrough for setting up Caddy on a, on, on Linode specifically, but honestly, you could do this on any cloud provider, any server, it doesn't even have to be a cloud provider, you can do this on your own Linux machine if you want. Um, these are the right instructions, these are the right steps. Um, I love that they refer you to our official documentation, and yeah, it only takes a couple minutes. This is exactly how you go about starting to set up Caddy if this is your first time. So this video is really good. Thank you, Austin, for um, posting this. And uh, so yeah, I would actually, we have a Caddy playlist, by the way, um, on YouTube. I, it's a public playlist I made where I just kind of collect Caddy videos so if you want to check this out, you can. I think there's some good... I don't like endorse all of these necessarily, or like say they're all 100% correct or the best way to do things, but they're good watching material if you want to up your caddy game. Um, and they're generally, they're all pretty good. Um, so I would highly recommend giving this playlist a check. Anyways, so back to busy project. Um, we're preparing to enable HTTP 3 by default. We're hoping to be the first like general purpose mainstream web server to ship 
and enable HTTP3 by default. Um, yeah, so we're kind of waiting on a couple of things, but uh, mostly upstream, and I need to talk to our quick developer. He's, he's really cool. Martin's been doing an awesome job implementing that, but uh, I just have a few questions there. Um, and yeah, we can support 1xx status codes like HTTP early hints is a new feature of HTTP. Um, our friend in France, Kevin uh, Dungla, I believe is how you pronounce it, has done an excellent job contributing this feature. And so with Go119, our reverse proxy will support that. And we have a sponsor that's going to be testing that out um, pretty soon as well, which I'm looking forward to. So. Um, yeah, I have a lot of catch-up work to do. <laughs> but anyways, um, there was an interesting issue that came in the other day by Corey here. So Corey runs uh, App Masker. Uh, this, is a, this is a really cool service that uses Caddy to um, basically white label your web services, uh, anything. So we're talking like certificate management at scale. Um, with you know web servers, so App Masker is actually all about like basically making Caddy more manageable. Um, it's it's a managed Caddy service basically, which is really cool. Um, and they had an issue where uh, when disk storage is runs out, <laughs> so when you run out of disk space, uh, we get this problem where Caddy potentially creates a certificate, but it fails to write the contents of the PEM to the file, so you're left with a blank file. Um, and so he's seeing this error that you can see how nested this is in our call chain. Um, basically, you get to the end of the message here. <laughs> and the crux of the error is that there's no PEM block found in the intermediate certificate PEM file. So it's trying to provision a local, the local certificate authority. This is Caddy's self-signed kind of managed certificate authority. And um, uh, in order to sign certificates, Caddy generates a root and an intermediate certificate, and it will keep the intermediate certificate renewed. And it only has a lifetime of like seven days, I think. So um, it needs to renew that and occasionally write to this file. Um, and if you look back in the logs, you can see that you know it's it's doing that very thing. Intermediate expires soon, so it's renewing it. And um, it has an error generating new certificate. It's trying to generate the intermediate. It's trying to save it. And when it's writing the file, doo -doo 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 -doo, no space left on device. So presumably, it's created the file, um, but can't write it because the disk is empty. And so when Caddy goes to read it later, it, um, it, it, it sees an empty file and can't decode the pen block, and therefore Caddy uh, can't operate its internal CA. That is kind of a problem, especially if you later resolve the disk space issue. Uh, Caddy should probably keep working. And so this is definitely an edge case. Probably best to not let your disk get full. Um, you can see here that it was actually throwing other errors. Um, let's see here. Renewing certificate on demand failed. So. Um, this is a little different where Caddy was, you know, configured for on-demand TLS. It was managing certificates uh, for, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of different domain names maybe, probably tens of thousands if you're running out of disk space. And, um, and so a handshake comes in and Caddy gets a certificate to f satisfy this TLS handshake but sees the certificate is expiring, so it needs to renew it. Well, before Caddy renews a certificate, um, a, and, and this is not applied to the intermediate certificate for the, the internal managed CA. And maybe that's, maybe that's the, a bug or, or something, because I haven't, honestly didn't think about the case where storage is full and, and managing this like intermediate certificate. But um, you can see here that it's trying to renew a, a certificate. And what Caddy actually normally does in the normal flow for most of your sites, uh, other than the internal certificate authority self-signed certs, um, 
Caddy will actually perform a check on your storage, and it will try writing a file with random contents and then reading it, and then it will delete it. And if it can't do that, it won't even try to renew or obtain a certificate. And so um, you can see that it failed its storage check because no space left on device. And so the storage check in this case is actually doing its job. It's preventing a case where we get a certificate from a certificate authority and then we can't save it. In other words, that would require next time we need it, we would have to yet again go to the certificate authority and repeat the process and potentially run into rate limits and stuff. So this is actually like protecting your account, your server, your service. Um, it's still an issue that you need to fix as a system administrator, but uh, you know, cleaning up the disk space, getting more disk space, but uh, but at least here, Caddy was protecting you. And so um, while we don't have the same rate limit concerns while renewing our own intermediate certificate as a CA, um, we probably should not leave a blank file on the disk. Uh, and again, oh, this might have been log rotation. That's very likely, actually. I don't love Linux's like system control, journal control, or journal D, journal D. I don't love journal D's like um, logging I don't trust it, honestly, and it's really hard to use. But um, if you, yeah, if you look at this, we, we can do a couple things, right? We can either delete the file when we get the error writing it, and basically just clean it up so there's not an empty file. Because this is a file that's managed by Caddy, we would not expect it to be empty. It probably shouldn't be empty. So if there's an error writing it, we could delete it. Um, if there's no concurrent writers, that's probably safe, right? I think that's probably fine to do. Um, or we could manage this problem when we go to read the file. Um, this one might be, this option might be slightly more robust in that if the file is emptied from some other process or something external factor maybe, such that it, you know, leaves the file empty, then maybe this would be more robust because no matter how the file becomes empty, Caddy can still manage it and um, either ignore it or treat it like it doesn't exist um, or whatever. Whereas the first option, we can only we can only take care of the situation if if it's because the writing of the file fails, and that's probably mostly going to be the case. But I could imagine a case where I don't know, either like maybe a kind of a clumsy edit of a, of a file accidentally empties it, like externally, like let's say you're going in, let's say you're copying and pasting it, like because you need it for something, and you accidentally delete the contents and save the file at the same time. Unfortunate, but like I could imagine that being a case. The second option where we handle this error while reading the file could take care of that. So maybe, maybe that's a better option. Um, and so I actually, I want to look into that here. So let's see what that looks like. Um, do I have a branch for this? I don't remember if I, oh, empty files. Yeah, so ca.go, is that where this was? Yeah, so if you look here, we have this function loader gen generate intermediate. And you can see that we first try loading the existing intermediate certificate, the one that is presumably expiring. And if the error is nil, so this is where I made a change. If the error is nil, um, currently we just return error, or if error, sorry, this doesn't exist. So currently if error is not nil, and if it's not a does not exist error, then we would go ahead and generate it. Uh, oh, no, we would return the error. But I've since made a change here where, and this is, I haven't pushed this yet, this is still kind of, I'm still feeling this out. Basically, we try to read the file, and if the, we were able to read the file successfully, but the file is empty, in other words, we read zero bytes, then we actually create an error. We artificially set the error to this error empty, this value here. Um, and then we do our if error is not nil check. So if the error is that the file doesn't exist, 
um, we can actually, that's okay, that's expected, especially the first time you maybe use this feature where we generate the certificate. And so we can continue the flow. So we ignore that error, but now we also want to ignore the empty error because we want to actually treat these the same. I could just set this to error not exist, but I think I actually want to log if the file is empty. I think that that should be in the log so that somebody knows about that. <laughs> like that should never be the case. And so if it is the case, there's something you like something is wrong. Um, we can manage it. We can work around it and continue to generate and try rewriting it, I guess, but we should probably log it. Um, dot log dot warn, I guess. Um, intermediate certificate file was empty, but should not be. Regenerating. Uh, yeah, and then we'll probably just give the file name. Well, it's in storage. Storage might not be a file. We just call them files. It might be a database backend, but we just kind of treat it all the same. Um, Zap.string file name. I'm just going to say file name, even though technically it's like storage key. I don't know, but storage key intermediate cert. Which should return, yeah, a path. Okay, so we'll just log it. Should never be empty, but if it is, um, yeah, treat empty file and non existent file the same. Well, if non-existent or empty, we can re we can generate cert, but any other error is probably a uh, stopper. Show stopper. Um, yeah, something like this. So, and then we continue on to generate the intermediate, and the rest of the logic I think can be unchanged. Um, we could do the same thing for an intermediate key. So yeah, here's where I was like, oh, error does not exist, error empty. If error is not equal nil and error is dot is. Ah, see this, this, the key should always exist. Um, and it should definitely not be empty. But if it is empty, again, like, probably put the logging in. This is just kind of tedious, because, like, <laughs> we could probably treat other certificate management, not just CA certificates, but any certificate management kind of like this, where if we read an empty certificate file, treat it as if it doesn't exist. Probably we should do that. Anyway, there are several places in the code base where I should basically be making this change where we try reading. If we expect the file to be non-empty, then do this error check and assign the error if needed. And then, in our regular error check, handle the empty error case. Um, either ignore it here, like basically return the error unless we can handle it, in which case log it and then handle it. So I have to do this several places in the code base. The intermediate certificate is definitely one of them. There are other places where maintain, I don't know, where caddy is. Oh, no, not here. Uh, or caddy's maintaining certificates. Actually, some of this might need to be changed in cert magic. So caddy manages its own CA certificates, but cert magic manages server certificates, like your usual, you know, 
certificates, uh, server name certificates. So I might need to make that. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you by like repeating this over and over throughout the code base and finding tuning the details right now, but that's kind of the general approach I think I'm going to take for this. I don't know. It's a little annoying <laughs> um, to have it scattered everywhere, but and it's definitely an edge case, but it's probably one we should handle. So I will probably make progress on this in the next couple days. Um, yeah, so that is one of the most recent issues. We've got a few other issues here that there's, there's one other feature I, I do want to start working on that's not currently in an issue exactly. Maybe it is, I don't remember. Um, we do have a few bug issues open. Most of these are not a huge deal, um, or they're kind of, like, obscure. Yeah, some of these I just need to update and be like, uh, any more information? And maybe close them out, but, uh, some of these are definitely, again, nothing too serious, but, or are upstream problems that we can't really fix. Um, as far as these pull requests, most of these, some of these are kind of ready to go. I'm just waiting for them to be tested. So if you are interested in any of these features, for example, better graceful reloads, check that one out um, and that one. So if you're using WebSockets, definitely test this out, please. If you are using gRPC web, please check that out. Really need testers for that. Um, this one, 45 comments. This one is a neat optimization and a lot of good like profiling work is going into this. I just have like anxieties about whether it's a correct change. <laughs> and so uh, check that out if you're interested in that. I need to give more time and attention to that. But that one stresses me a little bit because it is just an optimization. It could be a good one, but it just I need to work through that. HTTP3 by default, please test that out if you're interested in that. Same with early hints, you need Go119 for this one. So if you're testing the release candidate of Go119, please try that out. A few of these I just need to get to that are good improvements, but um, yeah. Here's one that I authored, the caddy respond subcommand, basically quick and easy hard-coded HTTP server. So. If you just need an HTTP 200, just type caddy respond and you'll get a random port and you can just use that. Or you can set a status or you can set a body. You can even use templates and set the ports. And this is actually really cool if you want to test like load balancing and stuff. Um, got a comment from Brandon says, thank you for making placeholders work correctly in TLS server name. It helped me greatly simplify my config. Yeah, so that is a cool, um, that is a cool improvement. It was not trivial, exactly. Um, oh, hi, Francis. Thanks for joining. Francis, you've probably met him on our forums. He's like our number one helper, um, which I really appreciate. And he also makes a ton of pull requests and improvements, so I really appreciate his help. Um, hailing from Canada. He's going to be speaking at the API Platform Conference coming up in a few months. So highly recommend getting tickets to that, especially if you do any sort of PHP or if you're really interested in Caddy. Um, so the TLS server name stuff, uh, yeah, I think this is the pull request. So yeah, this I didn't author. This was by Kis Keroli Pal. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I appreciate this contribution because Yes, it does allow you to use placeholders when you are configuring a reverse proxy and you need to set the server name in your TLS handshake to the upstream. And if it needs to be dynamic, then yes, this will help you simplify your config a lot. The problem is <clears throat> it is not very efficient. So if you have a very high traffic server with very, a lot of uh, memory pressure, you might feel this one a little bit because not not a ton probably but like a little bit because the transport which 
it facilitates the round trip is actually pre-configured, obviously for efficiency, when the server is provisioned. And um, part of that is setting the server name. And so this contributor came up with a clever solution that um, actually we still use the pre-configured um, and pre-provisioned transport when the server you know starts up except on certain cases let's see here replace server um, TLS server name it's basically we, we call replace TLS server name on every round trip and if TLS is enabled and the configured server name uses a placeholder, so that's checking for the opening bracket there, then we do make a new transport. You can see this is not a super light allocation. It, I mean, there's a lot of fields here. And then we do run the replacer. Replacers themselves are very efficient, so the string replacement is very efficient. Um, this allocation is not the most efficient, but that's I think the best we can do, and it only happens for proxies where there's a placeholder in your server name field. So, and TLS is enabled. So it's it's the most efficient I think we can make it, and the simplest we can make it. So um, yeah, and so Brandon says it's not a very high traffic server. That's great. Honestly, even if you are a high traffic server, this might still be just fine for you. You just have to do your own testing. If you have metrics running, check and see the memory usage. If it's going way up. Um, then, you know, maybe let us know, but I don't know how much we could do about it. Oh, and Francis makes a good point in the comments that it turns off connection pooling for the proxy. So your network um, might be less efficient as well because we are not able to pool connections because we're making a new transport because the transport has to be dynamically configured if you're using a placeholder here, if that makes sense. Um, it's possible there could be changes to the Go standard library to facilitate dynamically changing the server name in a transport safely. Because transports are shared between connections, hence the pooling of connections and the higher efficiency. So we need like a thread safe way to set the server name. I, I don't know. They would have to, that would be kind of a, a sticky or a, a tricky improvement to make. So. Someone, I mean, if you want to, if you're interested in that, you're welcome to dive in and see, like, make a pull request to go and make a pull request to us and see if you can get the two to kiss. But, um, good luck. <laughs> uh, anyways, so, yeah, good issue there. So we do have, let's see, I have a ton of notifications I need to go through. One thing I wanted to point out really quick before I start working on a new feature for a few minutes is... The, uh, a contributor, a member of our community has made an, a simple admin UI and he added some screenshots and uh, it's, it's, it's very simple, it's a good start though. I think it's a good start and I think it's cool so if you're interested in like a UI for managing your caddy instance, check out this guy's project. Um, I don't know why I can't zoom in on these images. I think he added these to the GitHub repo. They're just really small screenshots. But anyways, yeah, there's there's a UI. So that's cool. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, this is kind of similar, I think, to what I'm going to be doing. So here's a feature request from August 2020 with a lot of thumbs up. I didn't actually see until just now how many people want this. Uh, post certificate provisioning hook. So basically a way to run a command after a certificate has been provisioned. Um, Francis has started work on kind of a more formal event system within Caddy. Um, I think it's a, an app, a Caddy app module. Caddy event, yeah, so the event app. Um, I do intend to... Hmm. Francis says my audio is weird. Are we a little better now? Let me know if there's audio problems. Because I am on Linux and that would not surprise me. 
Uh, so this event system is going to be cool. I intend to check this out next week and uh, and actually pull this down and try it out and probably stream some of it. We can work on it, but it would allow you basically to uh, interact with Caddy in real time as it does stuff um, by, yeah, with external tools and services and stuff that you might have. So we will be working on that. There's, um, there is a similar feature that I want to work on today for a, um, a potential user, um, or hopefully a potential sponsor, um, that will, oh, let me commit this really quick. Um, uh, log error if file is empty. Yeah, log if file is empty. Just commit that. Stage, then commit. Okay. <clears throat> Check out master. Yeah, okay. Back on master. And uh, yeah, Francis, I would love to chat with you about that event system. So we can hop on a, a call or a stream together. That'd be kind of fun. Um, oh, by the way, um, if, uh, nope, that's not it. If you were in the Go community, yeah, like any time in the last, like, six, seven years ago, like 2015-ish. Um, remember the Martini framework? So Jeremy, uh, anyway, I loved using like Martini and Negroni and stuff. And uh, and so Jeremy contributed a lot of that, spoke at .go, and then kind of fell out of the Go community for a while as he did, I think, product, product, project management. Um, but then he like amazingly just returned kind of out of the blue. Um, this last year and I was super excited to see that he's working with Nats now and um, he's gonna be streaming as well he kind of challenged me to <laughs> to stream starting today but Jeremy's awesome so if you get a chance check out his his work um, Nats is an exciting technology and he's actually contributed a um, a caddy plugin for Nats support it's right here actually his top pinned repository at the moment um, it's a caddy module that allows the caddy server to interact with the NAT server. So it supports publish, subscribe, fan in, out, request, reply. And so you can bridge your HTTP services with NATs um, in a very straightforward way. So this is really cool. Um, if you're interested in this, um, check out his work. Um, he's going to be speaking at Go West conference here, which is kind of the, our my local Go conference um, in a couple months. So I just got my ticket, uh, gowestconf.com, I think. Yeah, I just got my ticket, uh, and I'm excited to to see all the speakers and, and meet everyone there. So if you're going, or if you're in the mountain west of the United States, or Canada, or something, would love to, to meet you if you want to come to Go West. So I will not be speaking, but I will be there. Um, yeah, let me clean up here. Do, do, do. Okay, so let's write a little feature. So we have a request basically for a, <clears throat> a feature that will basically when Caddy needs to obtain or renew a certificate, um, we have a request that Caddy would actually just um, shell out it to a command to get that certificate. Basically give the command a CSR or a domain name at least or something and then have the command spit out the certificate to use uh, and then have Caddy use it that way. Um, so Caddy has a few different ways of getting certificates. Um, we have issuer modules and we have manager modules. Um, issuer modules are uh, like our Acme issuer they implement a method called 
uh, issue. This is the crux of it. They, it implements some other methods like setconfig and precheck and issuer key, but the main functionality here is issue. And so a certificate issuer, so this is Caddy's Acme issuer, which uses you know, the Acme protocol, let's encrypt, ZSSL, all that jazz. Um, basically, you get a certificate signing request and it should return an issued certificate. So um, it's pretty straightforward. Obviously here it's just one line of code because we delegate to cert magic to do that. Um, but uh, that's basically the input is a certificate request and the output is an issued certificate which is literally the PEM encoding of a certificate and maybe metadata. Um, so we have a zero SSL issuer as well that is custom because it does it deals with zero SSL's um, account. So if you have a zero SSL account, you can see it in your uh, dashboard there. Um, there's also managers though. And so managers uh, are a little different they are modules that represent something else managing a certificate. So, for example, Tailscale integration works this way, where Caddy basically will say, hey, I need a certificate right now. Just give me the certificate. Um, and so certificate managers implement a get certificate method, which you might be familiar with from the Go standard library. It's a pretty similar signature. Um, and... Uh, except that yeah we it's, it's actually a very similar signature except i think we add context but basically the input is a client hello so this is like during a tls handshake i need a certificate right now and give me the certificate a tls certificate um and so this is great where tailscale is managing the certificate for you if on your tailnet like your tailnet domain um and so all we do is ask tailscale for the certificate and um, and just return it. So that's really nice. We can integrate seamlessly that way. There's another manager here that can actually get um, certificates from like from an HTTP request. So that's kind of a generic one that you can hook into. Um, and so which one is right for this case? I would say that we probably want to implement an issuer because this is called when Caddy needs a certificate or like doesn't have one or needs to renew a certificate um, as opposed to we need a certificate right this second you should already be managing it you know it's a little different it's subtle but it's different and so um, I think we're going to implement an issuer here and so I'm actually just going to copy this whole file which is a little overkill but I will trim it down here and I'm going to say I'm going to call this the um, command issuer, I guess, where we call a command or we execute a command to, to get a certificate. So command issuer, issuer, I say manages certificates, issues certificates by invoking a shell command, I guess. Um, oh, Francis says in the comments uh, for PKI app, that was requested to spit out client certs from the PKI CA. Oh, yeah, sorry. I didn't see that comment in time. But yes, that's, that's right. So, I don't know, command issuer. I'm going to delete all this config stuff. Actually, I'm going to keep the logger. That's probably useful. And all the other stuff. So tls.issuance.command I could do .cmd I don't know might as well spell it out our constructor returns a command issuer that would be a fun bug um, okay uh, what time are we looking at I don't want this to go on too long I don't want you guys to get bored um, it's been, what, 40 minutes-ish? Where is the... T oh, yeah, 40 minutes. <clears throat> um, I'll try and wrap this up soon. I'm not going to finish this today, but we'll get the basic idea. Um, we have a provision method. Set the logger. Uh, yeah, I, 
think that's all we need to do right now for that. We can delete all this, delete set config, delete pre-check, I think, command issuer. The Acme issuer is really complicated. Issuer key. I'm just going to return. This is basically just a, an ident like an, a unique string that kind of identifies what this issuer is. It's for like logging purposes and stuff and, and storage, certificate storage. Um, I'll just return command. Oh, and then we'll save this. Uh, command issuer. CMD issuer. I don't know. <clears throat> And then, yeah, that obviously is not going to work. Not implemented. Uh, revoke. We are probably not going to worry about that for right now. That's another optional method. Get Acme issuer. We are not Acme. Unmarshal caddy file. This might actually be useful. Um, It basically gives caddy file support for this module, which we probably will want to do. And by the way, I don't know if this is going to be in the core of caddy yet or as a plugin. Um, we'll have to see. I'm gonna just comment all this out for right now because some of this boilerplate is kind of handy because, like, it, it's pretty simple to unmarshal a caddy file. You just call for dispenser.next and then you just you know, is there another argument, or if there's nesting, it's nifty to have this for loop here for you. Just comment that out for now. Um, on demand ask request, don't need that. Parse caddy file for chain options. Like, there's a lot of stuff that we just don't need. Chain preference. Cool. And then command issuer. We don't care about pre-check. We don't care about revoking. I don't care about config setting. So now we have a pretty simple file. And we can just ignore that in our problems tab. Okay, so to issue a command, the crux of it, or to issue a certificate with a command, um, I mean, the, the core logic here is pretty simple, right? It's exec.command and then you pass in, I don't know, whatever the command is and then args, right? Like, that's kind of how it works. So, obviously we need a way to, for the user to configure what the command and the argument should be. Um, I would rather, I would prefer the user separate these out for us rather than us having to call in some library like Schlex, which is great, but I'd rather not do the parsing myself and try and like pretend we're a shell, you know? I would rather the user give us very specifically and very precisely what the command is and then what the arguments are. So, um, JSON command, and obviously we need to, we need to add JSON tags so that should be required. The command to execute um, string JSON args, I guess? I don't know. Oh, and that's an array of strings. Um, arguments to the command. I mean, this should be pretty straightforward. We've all done this, right? We've all run commands before, so I don't think it need too much docs yet. Famous last words. <laughs> I don't need to document that. Uh, ish dot command, ish dot args, right? And then we have this cmd, this command, and then it's cmd dot output, basically. we get an error, return nil, an error. So the output probably would be 
probably would be best if the command outputted a pem block. <clears throat> so like pem decoding it basically. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so it'd be simple as return output dot, or sorry, return cert magic dot issued certificate certificate output and then nil I guess metadata so we use metadata with like Acme issuers because we store stuff about like because uh, Acme has state related to a certificate that you can access via HTTP like um, it's the, the URL for the certificate, like where to download it, um, and that kind of thing. With this, I don't actually know if we have metadata we need, like, I don't know. <laughs> if I think of some, we can add it, but I don't think we need any. So, I mean, that's kind of the crux of it. It's pretty simple. We, when Caddy needs a certificate now, if you configure this issuer, it will run the command and return the command's output. So as long as it, it as long as it outputs uh, pem encoded dir encoded ASN one data. <laughs> so many encodings. Encodings upon encodings. The command must output the pem encoded certificate chain. Um, to standard out. Yeah. Of course, this is not super ideal because um, if there is an error, we probably want to capture its output and return that and stuff. And so this is not a production ready implementation yet. Uh, oh, I want to also create a branch. Um, we'll call this CMD issuer. And just one line that, it's pretty easy. Unmarshal caddy file. Uh, command. Should it be CMD or command? Like, how do you want this to look in the caddy file? I don't even think we need any, like, block, honestly. It should, it could be as simple as, like, cmd, and then the actual command, and then args. And those would be optional. Oh, duh, we need to pass, uh, <laughs> you're probably like, what about the CSR, Matt? <laughs> yeah, we need to pass the CSR to the command somehow. Um... <sighs> We could pipe it to its like standard in. Um, I know this particular user just needs the domain name, which we could supply as an argument. So we could do like the command and then the arg and then tack on the rest of their args. I, and this is where I think I need to actually go back to the, the user and be like, what specifically do you need? In my opinion, the most general purpose useful implementation of a module like this would give the command the CSR as like a pem encoded string through um, through its standard in. And so then the command would read its standard input, decode the CSR, from which it could get things like the domain name, um, the key and signature information, and other stuff. Um, you get the most information that way it's very general purpose very like easy to use so what I might do that standard in equals uh, yeah I mean basically we need to set that which to a reader which we can get pretty easily um, pem dot encode to memory can we just do this <laughs> no, we need a. Um, uh, how do you encode a certificate request as PEM? I don't remember. 
I'm pretty sure cert magic does this. Shall we see? Cert magic. Actually, it might not. It might be Acme Z that does this. We need to encode the certificate request as PEM. And Acme client. Here we are. So we get a CSR, do issue, obtain certificate. Yeah, so we actually do, this is in Acme Z. So this goes another dependency deep, another library I wrote called Acme Z that um, actually it's an Acme client written in Go. <clears throat> um, so it's probably doing Oh, CSR.raw. Ah, that's right. Okay, so this is actually... Actually, maybe this is all we need. So, base64 encoding of the raw. I forgot about that because... Um, create certificate request. Yeah. Okay, so this function is in the standard library and it converts a certificate request as like a, it treats it like a template and returns a fully populated certificate request which includes setting its raw field um, somewhere raw yeah here we are raw um, so that's great because now we don't have to worry about that. And all we have to do is base64 encode it, um, which is there's a way to get a reader from that, isn't there? Base64.raw URL encoding dot um, Is it base64 encoding? Oh, those are writers. Um, so I guess we have to, I'm just trying to think of like a, an elegant way. I guess an encoding is a writer? Let me see. A64 encoding. No, it is not a writer. Oh, no, it is. New encoder returns a right closer. So, new encoder. Okay, and then to a writer. Call right and then close. <laughs> Okay, so we could do this purely stream-based where we we pipe together this writer with a reader and pass that into uh, the, pass that into standard in, but I don't think I'm going to worry about that. <laughs> so I'm just going to encode it to string. We'll keep this simple. Um, B64 CSR and then strings dot it is a string encode Um, code to string, strings that new reader be. Yeah. Um, so basically, this would. 
How does encode the string work? <laughs> yeah, it just makes a byte buffer and then calls encode and then returns it as a string. That's nice and convenient. Um, this is probably not a high volume, like, this is probably not a bottleneck, this particular function. So I'm not going to worry about optimizing it for right now. Maybe we could do things slightly more efficiently. I don't know. But this is fine. Basically, we base64 encode the CSR, pass it to standard in, and read the output. Again, this is not a production-ready um, implementation because I mean, we could just do this. I'll leave it separate lines to make it more readable. But um, I like setting up the command and running it, kind of keeping that together. So yeah, we encode the CSR. So basically a command, um, the command will receive the base64 encoded ASN1 dir encoding of the CSR via its standard in. The command must output the PEM encoded certificate chain to standard out. Okay. I mean, encoding suck, but again, there are libraries for most of that, so it should make it fairly doable, I think. I don't, I don't know. The, this user might still just want the command or the domain name, and honestly, like, maybe if that's the case, maybe we can have, like, an option here to, like, I don't know, domain only or something, or, or maybe some options here to customize how the command is invoked to, to make it a little more flexible. Um, but... And obviously we can do better here too, like we can, we should probably set timeouts and handle errors better and, you know, stuff like that. But I think for now this is going to be fine. So I'm going to go ahead and commit and push this um, and check on how things are going with the user, but yeah, um, some really good things happening with the project. So thank you for all who contribute and help. and. Um, please remember that this project operates uh, in, in the capacity it does uh, from sponsorships and so really appreciate our sponsors um, which you can see if we click sponsor you can see who is sponsoring Caddy's development and we really appreciate all of you um, really honored to have quite a, all of you really sponsoring it, uh, including quite a few developers that I look up to myself. Um, you know, Andy Saylor, Filippo, of course, um, Beyong over at Sourcegraph, Francis is actually sponsoring, which is great. Love that. Um, and GitHub themselves actually recently sponsored, which was cool. Um, Jeremy sponsoring, uh, Jay Shah, Jacob um, from Let's Encrypt or EFF, he's, you know, I really appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, every single sponsor I really, I really value. So thank you to all who make it possible. Without that, I couldn't work on Caddy full time. If your company uses Caddy, um, I strongly recommend getting a sponsorship. Uh, if you guys are, if you're a startup, then get one of the startup packages. If you're an independent professional, then maybe, you know, just one of these, like, $25, $50 a month tiers. Um, you can kind of level up your caddy game. Um, you can get some basic email support. Um, if you're a startup and you're building out new infrastructure and, you know, and this is what your, um, your revenue flow basically allows for, then I definitely recommend these. Our sponsors, I just emailed one yesterday. And he's like, I'm really grateful for our sponsorship. Like, it's great that I can just email you, have something, have a question answered, have it figured out pretty quick. Um, but established businesses definitely get a sponsorship because if your company is relying on Caddy's technology, you, you <laughs> I guarantee you will appreciate the continued development and the access to support, including video calls and professional services that we can offer. Um, and then if you're if you do work for a large company that's using Caddy, um, even if it's just kind of an internal use, the enterprise sponsorships are. Uh, they're actually going fast. Um, 
we just had one go this week and so I highly recommend these they're extremely valuable for um, getting bugs fixed and getting features implemented that you need um, maybe stability if you need some stability in releases or con consistent release schedules um, or if you need extended professional services again the enterprise sponsorships are the way to go for that um, and all these are kind of customizable so if you want to uh, if you want to have publicity um, or certain perks or whatever then talk to me about it and we can totally do that so really appreciate everyone who contributes um, and makes this possible uh, and hope to see you for the next stream